since three of my last pulpit fillings seemed to focus on misery and suffering and came from Lamentations and Ecclesiastes, I thought this would be a great time to break the mold and maybe move on a little bit. So today, I prepared to examine biblical joy. Now, Chantel and tradition demand a title to this thing. And I've gotten a lot of questions on Joyce and Rejoice, which I thought was a little cute at first. But I thought, if one rejoices, does that not mean to joyce again? You joyce the first time, and you do it again, that would be rejoice. And after seeing it in print, I don't much like it anymore either. <laughs> but in any event, we're going to check out biblical joy. And what I found studying this was that it's so clear and obvious, and maybe some of you need things to be clear and obvious too. And though I project more of an Eeyore image, Scripture has much to say to my grumpy donkey personality. And as usual, I'd better listen to God's word. And so indeed, I thought we'd explore biblical joy. Yes, joy. Me. Joy. And the book which came to my mind immediately was Philippians. It just popped right up. And so we'll read parts, we'll read Philippians chapter 1, and I'll be referring to some other parts of Philippians because you just can't, well, you could. Henry Fickert is echoing in my mind, read the whole thing, Kevin, but we will just read chapter 1 and refer to other parts of Philippians. So, beginning with verse 1, Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ, to all God's pe holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, Together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And it is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains, as Paul was at this point, or defending and confirming the gospel, as he was doing while he was in his chains, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best, and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage, so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. 
Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that, through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. And I will stop there for the moment. Paul writes to the church in Philippi as seemingly his special favorite. He singles them out for special praise and encouragement. And I wanted to know more about these people, about whom Paul says... I thank God in all my remembrances of you. In all of my remembrances of you. Do you know people who, when remembered, always are worthy of thanks? That's pretty powerful. There is actually quite a bit of external information about this northeastern Greek city in which Paul arrived around 49 AD. In his, its history... As a prominent region goes back to Philip II, Alexander the Great's father, who conquered it and in an act of epic and colossal inhumility, named it after himself. He then turned it into a military bastion to project power and protect gold mines. It also lay in the heart of a key series of trading routes. Later still, its most well-known historical event event put it in our English books for centuries. Mark Antony and Octavius defeated Brutus and Cassius and those who had killed Julius Caesar, forever ruining the lives of sophomores the world over who are forced to read about this in Shakespeare's play. Octavius, having defeated Antony and Cleopatra, humbly established himself as Caesar Augustus, or Caesar the Great, the ones that our children recite about from Luke 2, and then renovated Philippi some more. He turned it into a retirement city for soldiers, making it even stronger. He also rewarded many faithful soldiers, Ben, he allowed them to live there, to own property and not pay poll or land taxes. Ladies and gentlemen, Philippi was a crucial city on the stage of the known world, and this is where Paul planted a church. We should remember, of course, that the only reason Paul ended up there at all was the vision God sent, directing him to Macedonia as opposed to points to the east. Religiously, the Philippi Paul confronted was a syncretistic environment. The people there worshipped all manner of gods, mixing and matching and blending beliefs from emperor worship to Isis from Egypt and many others thrown in for good measure. And this is the place where Paul planted his church. Philippi apparently didn't have the ten adult men necessary to have a synagogue, or Paul couldn't find such a place where he usually would begin. And this forced Paul to chase down to the river to find a less formal prayer group, which notable among the women there was Lydia, probably a wealthy and established merchant, and her household, we are told in Acts, joined her in seeking God's truth. This is also the city in which Paul and Silas, as we read in Acts 16, cast out the demon from the girl angering her profiteering masters. And Paul and Silas were then jailed, giving them opportunity to testify to the jailer, producing a harvest of amazing results in that family. These kinds of amazing and powerful works of God drew Paul into a close relationship with the church in Philippi. So Paul writes this book while in prison, and though the exact location the scholars I looked at couldn't be nailed down, he's definitely in prison. And the Philippians know where he is, 
since they had sent Epaphroditus to him. But Paul is in prison again. And this would be a first century prison. Even if he received good treatment, he was in a rat-infested, damp stone cesspool. Movement, of course, was limited. Freedom was naturally non-existent. Creature comforts were, for sure, only a distant memory. And I think it's worth a minute or two to provide a backdrop to his joy to consider the conditions in which Paul pronounces his contentment and joy. The Roman historian Sallust says the kind of prison in Rome in which Paul stayed could have been called a house of darkness. Few prisons were as dim, dank, and dirty as the lower chamber Paul may have occupied. Known in the earlier times as a Tullianum dungeon, its neglect, darkness, and stench gave it a hideous and terrifying appearance. That's a quote. The consequences of these conditions is unbearable heat, dehydration of the prisoners, plus because of the need of security, there was no ventilation because there would probably have been no windows, and the lack of air sometimes would be to serious levels. And they were generally devoid of light entirely. And apparent even in the free prison at Rome for some upper class prisoners, it was known locally as the place of darkness. And finally, neglect and abuse were known in the manner of diet and hygiene. Securing adequate nourishment fell mostly on the shoulders of the prisoners, families, and friends. Poor prisoners often were neglected and suffered great misery, and to depend on the ration of the prison was actually to put their life at risk because of the lack of variety, quantity, and quality of the food. In fact, it was about half the amount of food given to the lowest slaves at the time. And that barely sustained life, and that lack of food could easily be turned into a weapon against them. The only generosity and official provision for many was a final meal before execution. May I remind us all again that Paul in these circumstances is rejoicing and rejoicing, expressing joy and thanksgiving and praising God. So as I see it, we need to examine the source of God's ability to remain joyful if we're going to get this joy thing right. Scripture, of course, makes it embarrassingly simple. It's so simple that even I can't mess this one up. First, and obviously, Paul's joy is not rooted in his circumstances, but in something he refers to as contentment. And so what's the contentment based on? Certainly not on his available spending money, not on the quality of his up north cabin, Obviously not in any family. Obviously not in his job, which, by the way, had landed him in that jail in the first place. Not on his latest round of par golf at Whistling Straits. Not in the size of his largest Pope and Young whitetail. In fact, his circumstances mitigate entirely against human comfort and contentment. What doesn't change, get worse, or make him uncomfortable, or ever disappoint him, as he says in chapter 118, is that Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. In chapter 125, Paul clears away doubt again when he asserts that his joy is in the faith. He lives that always Christ will be honored. And Paul derives unbounding joy from that. This is Paul's unchanging and unfading source of joy and contentment. And as he states in chapter 4, verse 10, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. Simply put, the Lord is the source of Paul's joy because it's based on a contentment rooted in the Lord. Obvious, absolutely. True, Indubitably. So to reiterate, 
Paul's joy is rooted in his contentment based on a relationship with Christ. Second, and this one's even easier yet, maybe, Paul's joy is powerfully enhanced in, by, and through his fellow believers. Notice he repeatedly identifies the joy of fellowship of believers. In verse 3 he says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In 4, in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. And later, I have you in my heart. And further, I long for all of you. Paul derives intense personal joy, real unfading contentment, from the community of believers within which he lives. And even at a distance, he writes in verse 27, I know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, which is the root of his contentment. And the final thing is, and these are hardly, they're so obvious, it's hardly worth mentioning, but Paul mentions a dozen or more times his conclusion about what to do with all of this. The words joy or rejoice are mentioned that often, and not to mention words associated with it. He writes, rejoice in the Lord always. So first, rejoice in the Lord. We got that. Always. Okay, that's a lot. Again, okay, so he repeats himself again. I will say, rejoice. A few verses later, I rejoice. A few verses later, I will rejoice. And so on and so on. So, where's the so what in all this? Where is the application? Well, it seems awfully obvious to me. Number one, root and ground our joy in Christ first, and then all else you need will be added unto you. This is the necessary condition for all other joys and comfort. Nothing, absolutely nothing, proceeds without this. This is the sine qua non, the thing without which there is no other of the fulfilling, joyful Christian life. A life grounded in the Savior and Lord Jesus is the only foundation of true joy. Period. Therefore, the first so what is, based on this truth, that I, above all others, must ask myself if I'm not joyful, not happy, joyful, content. If I'm not living a joy-filled and joy-distributing life, is my faith grounded in Christ? Am I in a right relationship with the source of all that joy? Consider that. It's part two we often forget and overlook, and that is, to me, the need to grow in the joy of our community of believers. I am an import to Oostburg. As a cedar grover, I made the pilgrimage years ago, though my great-grandfather was the first president of the village of Oostburg. I feel compelled to mention that. John Neinheis, indeed. But I've gotten to know a lot of you people here. And you are a group of gifted, wonderful people. Through difficult times, through joyful times, through health problems, through financial uniquenesses, you have been joy givers. I have praised God for you to many people, including my students, in fact, over and over. I mentioned to them the blessings you have lavished on me and my family and how that has grown into my own genuine joy. So God has placed you. If John Oltoff were here, he would say you and you and you and you. In this body of Christ. If you're a visitor, hopefully you have your own such place. 
Answer the calling to which God has called you and bring your gifts to the body as an offering to God. Consider the people sitting in the piers near you as God's specific blessing to bring and multiply your joy. Yes, even the one who drives you crazy at congregational meetings. Even the one who bothered you back in high school. Especially the one you need to get Matthew 18 with. If you're anything like my more youthful self, you struggle to really appreciate your particular body of Christ and therefore you may be missing one of Paul's keys to joy and contentment. As Paul almost soaked and bathed in the soothing joy of those in his Philippian family, so God has placed you in a community for your and their joy, which in turn brings glory to God. Surely one of our chief ends. Number three, re-up your joy. In obscure old Latin, the prefix means, duh, again. But sometimes it also means again and again. Did you notice, as I finally did, that rejoice is a verb? Joy, on the other hand, is a noun. It's a condition, it's a state of mind, and a state of heart. But as I noticed at about 4.32 this morning, lying in bed thinking about this, Rejoice is a verb. It's something we do. It's a volitional act. So if I'm sad and choose to act, I lament. And that's something I apparently specialize in. But it is equally true that when in a condition of joy, something we've already established as the result of contentment rooted in Christ, we can choose to get up, dust ourselves off, and rejoice. We are empowered not by ourselves, but by God himself to run around dumping joyce on people again and again all over the place and then rejoice again. Imagine if we specialized in just being annoyingly supportive, content, and joyful. Not shallow, hallmark, happy, perkiness, or precious moments, cutesy pie, but real, solid, eternal, contented, shalom grounded in Christ. Wouldn't joyful uses be more God-honoring? Wouldn't rejoicing believers draw the unbeliever to seek the source of the obvious joy? I don't know for sure, but I think that I'm finally getting it. Honor God with a joyful life. And I certainly speak to me as much as I speak to you. So, how about this? Let's us, First Duisburg CRC, choose to multiply our joy again and again by grounding our joy in the Lord, seeing our Christian community as a great magnifier of joy, and then again and again choose to rejoice, to make an overt, intentional decision to live rejoicing lives. There. Was that more joyful than Ecclesiastes and Lamentations? I hope God would say so. Let's pray.